this morning's event. Uh, my name is Tom Whitehead. I'm the head of the policy team at the British Embassy in Budapest, or Thomas Whitehead, as I'm rather grandly titled here. Um, the embassy was pleased to support this project, um, expertly delivered by Political Capital. I'm sure, like me, you're looking forward to hearing more details about the results and to the thoughts of James, Anna Maria and Andrash. As Peter, Peter Krakow will set out, the idea of this project was to analyse the Hungarian perce pe people's perception of Russia. Uh, I'm sure we'll see some striking results. The fact is, people do, things, do see things in different ways depending on their perspective. For example, the British public's perception of the number of immigrants in the UK has frequently outstripped the reality by a great deal. This has led to politicians and wider society in the UK facing difficult challenges in responding to this perception. So I hope this project will help to illuminate that debate in Hungary about perceptions of Russia. Uh, Russia is an important subject for this country and for my country. Let me take this opportunity, if I may, to briefly outline the, govern the UK government's position on Russia, um, which you could call our perception. It goes without saying that the current relationship between the UK and Russia is not the one that we, the UK, want. The UK has no quarrel with the Russian people, and we continue to hold out hope that one day, once again, we will enjoy a strong partnership with the government of this great nation. But a pattern of Russian aggression over the past decade, the murder of Alexander Litvinenko, its actions in Georgia, in Crimea, and Ukraine more widely, the attack in Salisbury, and the campaigns of reckless and irresponsible cyber attacks undermines Russia's claim that it is a responsible international partner upholding the rules-based international system. Russia's flagrant disregard for our international law laws and norms poses a threat to the order on which our collective security and prosperity depend. It is particularly important to reflect on this as we approach the fifth anniversary of Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea. That's why the UK is at the forefront of those opposing Russia's malign activity and the abuse of the international rules-based system, for example, in challenging its actions in Ukraine, in Syria, in the Western Balkans, in cyberspace, and in imposing sanctions. Together with our allies, including Hungary, in response to the attack in Salisbury, we coordinated the largest ever collective expulsion of Russian intelligence officers fundamentally degrading Russian intelligence capability for years to come. In these actions, we have seen the impact of international unity and a collective response to these threats. As long as Russia persists in its efforts to undermine our interests and values, we must continue to de deter and counter them. So let me end my remarks by moving away from international relations and focusing again on today's event. Um, I'm particularly pleased that James Sher um, of Chatham House, one of the UK's, if I may say so, foremost experts on uh, the post-Soviet space, is able to join the panel today. Uh, well done to Peter and the team at Political Capital for persuading him to come back to Budapest, um, although I know a visit to this beautiful city does not usually require too strong an arm twist. Um, as I said at the outset, the British Embassy was pleased to support this project. I hope the report we're going to discuss today will prompt some interesting debates. Thank you all for coming and please enjoy. Thank you. Thank you much, Tom, for the, for the opening remarks and, and uh, welcome everyone. I'm Peter Krakow from Political uh, Capital Institute and I'm glad to see that this topic uh, attracts this uh, huge audience, in fact, far, be far bigger than we expected originally. Uh, and uh, we are re really grateful for the British Embassy for, uh, for partnering us in this, in this exercise, to pl uh, trying, to, uh, trying to have an impression on the perception of uh, Hungarians on Russia's economic, military, and other kind of uh, strength. Uh, I'm also quite uh, grateful to my colleagues who were participating in, the, in this uh, exercise in the poll uh, and, uh, and, and for writing the uh, study. 
András Ratz and, and Csaba Molnár, and also thanks for uh, Katalin Sitash, my, my colleague who is probably running around because she, she is mainly responsible for, for running the show here. So uh, welcome everyone, and I would like to quickly introduce the results uh, of, this, uh, of this whole uh, study, uh, and then uh, give the floor uh, to our distinguished speakers uh, in the next uh, uh, panel, uh, James Schur, Anna Maria uh, Kish, and, and Andras Dek, uh, who, with, with the guidance of Andras Schratz, will discuss uh, the results uh, and also some other interesting aspects of uh, the relationship uh, between West and Russian perception of Russia. So why did we start this whole uh, exercise? Why were we uh, interested in this, uh, in this topic? What we could uh, see for a rather long time is that the perception of Russia in the Western world is, is sometimes crossed along as a, as a distorted one. Perception is, of course, extremely important. And uh, uh, especially important because in an era of, I don't want to go into terminological details about it, but in an information warfare or a hybrid warfare, what we unfortunately can and have to discuss these days, perception is becoming sometimes more important than the reality itself. And if we uh, read the speeches and writings of uh, important decision makers and speak spin doctors uh, in and around the Kremlin, we can see that they all talk about the fact that sometimes information perception is simply more important uh, than the weapons themselves in, in, a, in a, a conflict, in an era of conflict and tense relationship. What we can see in most of the studies is that uh, despite the fact that uh, Russia has invested quite a lot of money, uh, Despite the economic crisis, uh, even an, uh, from a, a greater budget, on uh, improving its image worldwide uh, via propaganda channels such as Russia Today, but via a lot of other means as well, uh, the really or the the public opinion polls rather tells us that in the terms of classical soft power, Russia has been rather unsuccessful. Uh, if we take a look at the favorability ratings based on the Pew uh, database of, uh, uh, of Russia in, in a lot of, uh, some Western countries. For example, it showed quite a spectacular decline in the United States, in Spain, in Great Britain as well. Uh, if, sorry, it's 2018 uh, compared to 2013. So pre Crimea and, and, and the latest, latest polls, it shows in most of the Western countries, with a few exceptions, such as Italy, for example, such as Hungary, for example, in most of the countries, Russia's perception, Russia, Russia's image uh, was rather deteriorating in the last uh, few years. So if we uh, define uh, soft power in the sense of creating stronger attraction in the, in the audience in the Western world, it was largely unsuccessful. On the other hand, uh, we cannot uh, jump to the conclusion that all the communication activity uh, and strategy of uh, the Russian Federation uh, was uh, unsuccessful in the last few years. Why? Because if we ask questions uh, uh, that are about the perceived power of Russia, we are rather seeing an emerging trend in the sense that Russia is seen to be stronger than it was uh, a few years ago. Um, also from a Pew poll in 2018, uh, uh, a slide which uh, shows that the ones who say that Russia plays a more important role nowadays uh, than 10 years ago are more are an absolute majority in a lot of Western countries, uh, Greece, United States, but it's also quite high in the United Kingdom, in the Netherlands, in Hungary, in the whole Western world. So Europeans and the Western world rather tends to think that Russia plays a more important role in the world today than compared to, to 10 years ago. So I just wanted to highlight it to contextualize our, uh, our poll in Hungary, 
which is uh, which we don't think that that reveals something as a Hungarian specific phenomenon, but something as a Western specific phenomenon. We even have some plans to extend the scope of of our research. The interesting thing is that if we look back on the last 10 years, we don't really see in terms of, for example, the GDP data or other kinds of data that Russia really became fundamentally, I mean, in terms of its fundamentals, as a stronger country than it was a uh, um, few years ago or 10 years ago. Uh, if we, uh, why, so practically the objective of our, our research was because this is the first uh, First, first research project of that kind is that providing a reality check by comparing how the Hungarian population assesses Russia's military, economic, geographical, and social potential with Moscow's actual power. So it's a fact-checking exercise uh, on, based on public opinion polls. And, uh, and we wanted to check if the mystification of, of Russia is something as a real trend. Uh, what did we do? We most importantly did a uh, uh, public opinion poll or a representative surf, uh, survey uh, using Median's omnibus, uh, the 2018 October uh, omnibus, uh, where we put our questions. And, uh, and also we did uh, interviews with uh, policymakers, analysts, academics, who helped us to uh, interpret the uh, data. And we are re really grateful for for uh, for their help so uh, yes we developed the questionnaire and uh, you will see in the responses what our main uh, questions were if you're more interested in methodology we are happy to to give you responses in the q and a session i don't want to uh, get everyone bored with that right now so first of all we we were uh, curious about the uh, how people assess in hungary the military expenditure of of russia compared to other nations so the relative military uh, expenditure um, of, of of russia compared to other countries we use six uh, countries practically as a basis of, of uh, comparison, China, Germany, Hungary, Russia, United Kingdom, and United States, all through the, the survey. And what we found is that 43% uh, ranked Russia second, and 25% and, uh, of the respondents ranked Russia first, if we ask that how big Russia's military potential is, or military expand expenditure uh, annually compared to other countries. And what uh, is the reality, in fact, is that Moscow is only third, lagging significantly behind the United States uh, and lagging significantly behind China. So more than two thirds, 68% uh, of Hungarians overestimated Russia's relative military expenditure. Uh, we can see the uh, actual versus the, the real uh, a perceived uh, military uh, expenditure of Russia on this uh, slide, where it's it pretty much uh, uh, obvious that compared to the United States, most of Hungarians perceived uh, Russia's position um, right, but compared to China, there was, a, there was a quite a lot of uh, mistakes in the uh, perception. So the United States spends 10 times as much as Russia on, on its uh, military, based on the uh, latest uh, figures, while, um, while uh, China spends three times as much. But this is something that was highly over-perceived. What was the interesting thing? is that we could not uh, only say that the people who were more sympathetic to Russia were the ones who tend to overperceive Russia's military strength. What we found that uh, here, for example, the supporters of, of two smaller parties who are talking quite a lot about Russian influence otherwise, LMP, the Green Party in Hungary, and Momentum, the, the liberal uh, party, rate Russia's military strength uh, the highest. And interestingly, it might be just because of the uh, small uh, figures uh, in terms of, of, uh, of small parties, uh, voter base, but uh, the voters of democratic coalition were the least likely to overestimate Russia's uh, strength. 
So 67% we found that perceived Russian military uh, spending uh, larger than the Chinese, and 31% thought that Russia spends more on the military than the United States, which is really uh, far from the uh, reality. So we could mostly see this, this uh, exaggeration, this mystification tendency uh, in, the, in terms of Russia's military strength. But at the same time, we could also see it in, in terms of uh, Russia's economic strength. Uh, when we uh, asked uh, the uh, people to assess the uh, volume, uh, the export uh, activity of, of Hungary in the sense that we asked the respondents to, to check, uh, to, to rate that which countries uh, are, how important they are in terms of their uh, position as an export partner. And practically, what we found is that more than 80% uh, of respondents thought that Russia is in the first 12 export partners of Hungary. But as, as we can see it here in the, uh, at the, at the uh, slide, more than 50% thought that Russia is among our six most important export partner. The reality doesn't really come close to that because hung Hungarian export volume to Russia was the 17th largest value in 2017. So uh, while more than half of the, of the Hungarian population and one fourth of Hungarian uh, thought that, that it's um, among the first six, in fact, it was the 17th. So, so again, a big gap between the perception and uh, the reality. Uh, we also asked... Uh, the uh, people, what do they think in the, in the, uh, in the order of these six countries? I highlighted how um, big Russia's gross domestic product is compared to other uh, countries. And uh, the average of rankings was about four, less than four, 3.8. In, reali in uh, reality, Russia is the fifth, globally the 12th. Uh, in terms of the size of its economy. So again, we can see that the perceived position of Russia here was higher than the uh, actual position. And here, what we could pretty well see is that those who preferred Russia uh, to the United States as a strategic partner, uh, this ratio of respondents was the highest in the electoral base of Fidesz, the governing party, they had the tendency to overestimate the, uh, Russia's economic position. So the ones who preferred Russia over the United States were the ones who, who saw Russia as a bigger. And I mean, it, it, I do think that it, it can hint to that possibility, to, the, the, to that this discussion that paints Russia as an extremely important trade partner, way important than really is, and, and discussions that overestimate, for example, the, the impact of sanctions and not to talk about the counter sanctions on the, uh, on the Hungarian trade can possibly contribute to this uh, perception of Russia as bigger than it uh, really is. Uh, yes, uh, there were some other dimensions in which we could rather see that the perception of, of, uh, Russian, uh, of, of Russia is rather right or closer to reality. For example, Hungarians tended to perceive the dependence of the European Union on Russian gas rather in a right manner. Uh, 42% thought practically the right response when we were uh, asking the question about uh, what is the gas uh, dependence ratio of, um, of European Union uh, to, the, uh, to Russia. Also, when it came uh, to some other dimensions, sorry, I'm jumping a bit uh, uh, to, when it came to other dimensions, I didn't put here, uh, such as the geography of, of Russia, we could even see that the perceptions are rather right. So, right, in the sense that uh, most of the respondents told rightly that uh, Russia is the country that has the biggest uh, uh, territory uh, among the countries on the earth. When it uh, came to population, uh, we could see some overestimation in the sense that by 48% perceived the rank of Russia uh, uh, among the countries uh, in terms of population size accurately, uh, there was an overestimation tendency. So um, 
so while Russia's uh, population was rather overestimated, uh, not in terms of its ranking, but in, in terms of its actual numbers, uh, the uh, mean of estimates was 200 uh, 84 million, why the uh, actual value uh, of, of the, uh, of, of the uh, population of, of the Russian Federation is uh, 400, uh, 144 uh, million. So there was a tendency of highly overestimating the Russian population. Uh, there was a tendency to underestimating the, uh, the population of China and the United States, for example. So even if there were uh, more for per fair perceptions, we could see here as well that there is a tendency to overestimate. In terms of life expectancy, for example, we did not see a very huge gra gap between the uh, perception and the reality. And we have some other uh, indicators as well as uh, that we uh, found in the research. I don't want to uh, take too much of the time for introducing them. We will have a more detailed study published uh, in the coming days, uh, and you can read them there. Um, but as a general picture, there were some uh, good signs, uh, such as, for example, the disinformation disinformation threat or uh, the threat of Russia to interfere um, to other countries' internal security uh, procedures. This is something that, as a threat, is rather perceived by the Hungarian public. So there is some kind of alarmism, which is, I think, not necessarily bad. But in, in terms of the general assessment of the results, what, when, what can we say? Uh, first of all, the vast majority of the Hungarian population tends to overestimate Russia's military potential and its economic power, and at the same time have a tendency to overestimate the population. On the other hand, we can see that the majority of the respondents generally assessed Russia correctly in terms of its geographical size and its term to human dimensions and human indicators, such as a life expectancy. So there is not uh, an over-mystification in every field, but I would say in the two, uh, probably three most important things, uh, the population size, military and economy, there is this uh, tendency. Uh, overestimation is ov over the political spectrum. So we could find, as I said, that the, uh, that the overestimation of, of Russia's economic power is stronger in, among the Fidesz voters, uh, who are perceiving Russia as a more important uh, possible strategic ally of, of, of Hungary uh, than, uh, than the other voters. But at the same time, in some opposition parties, we found a similar uh, tendency. Uh, overestimation is irrespective of education, which is pretty important. So it's not like that people are simply lacking information uh, on the word as in, in general, and that's why they overestimate the strength of Russia. But it's much more, I think, the perception that is driven by the dominant public discourses in the issue. Um, and in general, I think it shows that while Russia can be par quite unsuccessful in terms of classical soft power, winning the hearts and minds of the Westerners to, to uh, prefer Russia over uh, uh, Western countries, in fact, it can be quite successful in sharp power in the sense that the general perception that uh, as, which is especially strong, not just since the Crimean annexation, but I think especially since the, the US presidential elections, that Russia can interfere into any electoral processes uh, to change the outcome of the elections, uh, to change the political landscape, uh, change the results of votes in parliaments, and so on and so on. Uh, these kind of discussions, which I think are important because uh, in a lot of cases, they reveal real vulnerabilities, real dangers, as a, as a negative side effect, they can lead to a, a perception in which Russia seems to be omnipotent. And if we think uh, in the logic of an information warfare, if the enemy is seen as omnipotent, this is already a one strategy uh, because it, it, it means that our uh, public opinion uh, can think that, okay, if, if Russia is so strong, why to fight against? Why not surrender? Why not admire uh, if it is uh, this successful? So uh, in terms of um, sharp power, uh, 
changing the perceptions and, and why are uh, a lot of tools, disinformation, conspiracy theories and others, I think Russia can successfully paint, uh, paint an image that is waste that it seems to be in the world, and that's why I think it's important to extend this research to other countries as well, more, uh, stronger than it uh, really is. So I think as a conclusion, I, uh, we can say that we should talk more about the weaknesses of the Russian model and the weaknesses of the Russian Federation, especially in a time where Vladimir Putin's popularity ratings are on a pretty low level, in a pre-Crimean levels, uh, because of economic hardships, because of the pension reforms, and because of the uh, Russian public's uh, boredom of, of, of geopolitics. Uh, I think it's a time to not just paint Russia as an omnipotent player, but talk about these kind of weaknesses. And I think probably as a, as a, as a, as a last slide, I would show something that is, in my view, one of the worst examples, the trap that we should avoid. Uh, this was, in fact, not a very bad uh, show back, back to 2015, if I remember well. And it was Farid Zakaria's show on CNN, but I think the title was simply horrible and was only something that, that uh, made the uh, spin doctors of the Kremlin quite happy. But Vladimir Putin, the most powerful man in the world. Is he really is? I, I, I would be rather doubtful. Of course, I mean, the sensationalist, sensationalist logic of media paints him as such, but this is something uh, I think that if we go into this logic, it's probably b more beneficial for the Kremlin and its supporters than uh, for the Western world. So that's it, what I wanted to tell. So thank you very much for your attention. I, I would uh, ask Andras to take over the panel and, and invite the guests to the table to discuss the results. Thanks a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, my name is Andras Ratz, and I have the, the pleasure and the honor to moderate this panel, and also the pleasure and the honor to have the Kremlin in my back. So I already <laughs> like, like feel the support. It, 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 it's already a nice feeling. Uh, and uh, without any, any further ado, uh, I would like to first and foremost introduce uh, members of our panel. Uh, right on my left, we have James Scher from Chatham House and from Estonia Foreign Policy Institute operating in Tallinn. And we are particularly grateful for James because he's here after a long and exhausting trip. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a great honor to, 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 to have you here. Somebody already took my chair. Good. Uh, <laughs> next to James sitting is Anna Maria Kish from the Center uh, from the Central European University's Center for EU Neighborhood Studies. And after uh, Anna Maria on the far left, but only in the geographic sense, uh, we have uh, Andras Deak from the Institute of World Economics, one of the best Hungarian experts on, uh, on Russia. And what we'd like to do here is first and foremost, I would ask all three panelists to provide a brief reality check on various aspects of, uh, of Russia's power. James starting with assessing how powerful Russia militarily is, I mean, in reality. Thereafter, uh, Anna Maria will address Another very popular stereotype uh, about Russia, a stereotype very common among Hungarians, because when discussing uh, the system of current, current Russia, you often hear the argument, but at least there is order there. At least Mr. Putin keeps the country safe and secure. Uh, we are going to get a reality check on that. And last but definitely not at least, uh, Andras Deak is going to provide another reality check on the strengths and weaknesses and on the actual state of the Russian economy. Uh, all three panelists, are, uh, we ask them to speak about 10, 15 minutes in the liberal sense, uh, and thereafter, we will have uh, a number of questions from my side, misusing my position happily, and thereafter, we will give the floor to the audience. So without any further ado, James, please. Andras, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, invited by friends. Um, I have always found uh, Budapest to be a very serious and testing intellectual environment, so I feel suitably challenged. Um, 
If you think I'm going to tell you that, our, that we overemphasize Russia's military strengths, I'm not. What I'm going to say instead is that the premises we have in looking at military power leads most people in the West both to underestimate Russia's military capacity and potential and grievously overestimate it. War is a tool of policy. The Russians believe this even more adamantly than Clausewitz. Uh, the pur ultimate purpose of national armed forces is to achieve political objectives by means of war. Any measure of military capacity or potential outside that context, outside the scheme of security that a country has for defending its interests makes no sense. It is purely a paper <coughs> exercise. Um, the starting point for any understanding of Russian military power today must be a realization that since 2014, even before, Russia has been actively waging what it regards as a strategic counteroffensive against 25 years of Western geopolitical and civilizational dominance. The post-Cold War, post War security order put in place and ratified by the Charter of Paris, by the Budapest document, um, by the extension of the Helsinki Final Act to countries of Central and Eastern Europe, um, is now regarded in Russia as frankly illegitimate. Um, um, it is the legitimacy of the overall security order which is in contest, and military power as a political as well as military instrument now plays an extremely important part in this, but in the wider sense. I believe Thomas from the embassy referred in passing to Russian activeness in the cyber domain, in uh, political interference and so on. Yes, that's <coughs> true. We think of this as a peacetime activity. The Russians also see this as a wartime activity. The Ministry of Defense has a strategy on information on the information space, in which it defines information war as the effort through a variety of information means to disorientate the opponent's state and society and persuade the opposing state to make, to make decisions in the interests of its adversary. Uh, so this is very wide integrated framework that Russia has and before going further I would say that Russia's greatest military strength has been the disciplined and purposeful maximization and tailoring of what the Russians know and the Russian general staff knows are limited means of national and military power to um, achieve their objectives. In this counteroffensive, although Russia today disputes the legitimacy of the borders of several European countries, uh, including three members of NATO, um, the, and has moved some state borders, Russia's fundamental objective is not to change physical borders of European states. It's to change the political borders and the political lines of demarcation in Europe. What do I mean by this? Uh, Russians affect, essentially divide Europe into three zones. There is first what is widely referred to as the historical West, with which Russia, quite, the Russians quite sincerely say, we have no quarrel with the historical West. Historical West means essentially the Holy, West, the Holy Roman Empire plus Scandinavia and the UK. Uh, loosely speaking, it is the West and continental Europe behind the <coughs> west of the Nysa River. Then there is Ruski Mir, 
the Russian world. Vladimir Putin is not the first Russian statesman who firmly believes that Russian civilization extends beyond the borders of the state. This is particularly the case of the Russian Federation, whose borders are not very different in Europe from the borders of Russia in 1560. Um, and this whole view that Russian civilization extends beyond this, Russia has rights beyond this, it has a duty and responsibility and privileges with regard to people who are part of Russia's culture, who Russia has influenced, who speak Russian beyond this, whether they're ethnically a Russian or not. This is part of his conception of the Russian state. That's what Ruski Mir is. And between these two zones, you have what is widely referred to as a gray zone. So before going further, one thing that needs to be understood is the borders that we think of in strategic terms, NATO allies, non-NATO, NATO partners, others. Uh, this, these are not Russia's terms of reference. And therefore the border between NATO and non-NATO from a Russian political and military point of view has no principal significance. Its practical significance depends on a correlation of forces, pretty much. And that, and that alone. The whole Russian tradition of thinking geopolitically is different from ours. If you are the product of a Western military academy, you are basically taught to define threat in terms of the capabilities and intentions of a likely adversary. A Russian military officer is not trained that way. He is trained to think about threat in terms of space. Who controls space? Who occupies space? It makes perfect sense. Russia is historically a multinational empire. It has problematic people on its near its state borders. It has ethnic Russians on what it sees as the wrong side of some of these state borders. Borders historically for Russians have been an enormous source of power and an enormous source of weakness. Um, Russian strength are almost always the response to its perceptions of Russia's own perceptions of weakness. Uh, so this space, the need for client states, the need for spheres of influence, the need for buffer zones, preferably all of this recognized, legitimized by others. These are the staple building blocks of Russian security. Okay, that is, that's the prelude to what you're actually asking me to, to, to assess, Russia's capability. The, by 2014, the perception that there was a consolidated threat from the West consisting of democracy promotion, colored revolutions, regime change, military intervention, all this was fused together in a consolidated threat assessment. This for Russia is what was at stake when Yanukovych fell from power in Ukraine. One purpose of Russia's whole imposing scheme of military deployments in Europe is to ensure that in this entire zone that Russia defines as legitimately its own, we have no military options whatsoever. So if, for example, there is a major revolution in Belarus and it, it requires the suppression by Russian troops on a very brutal scale, the West will stay in its box. This is one purpose of it. The second, though, in conditions that Russians see as prativaborstva, antagonism, implicit confrontation, to keep the West and the NATO alliance under pressure. Uh, to demonstrate that in every single area of dispute, Russia has war-waging capacity and we have none. Because what military power we have is overwhelmingly in the wrong places and it's not particularly suited to uh, all of these particular needs. Um, is, I'm not exaggerating, Russia's ability to actually produce this capability now, it has done a great deal of that. Nevertheless, here are the limiting factors. 
The first is the Russians understand perfectly well they cannot win a long war against NATO uh, because, <coughs> because the basics of military and economic power and the technological level to do this are not there. But a long war against NATO means two things. It means a war in which NATO's power, which today is not properly mobilized, is properly mobilized and brought into the equation, and B, that the alliance actually endures and remains unified. What the Russians therefore aim to do, if, if the circumstances arise, is confront NATO with a short war that fragments the alliance very early and brings the alliance to the negotiating table very swiftly on Russia's terms. And that is the basic purpose of everything we see in the Nordic Baltic region, which is regarded as a whole, and in Crimea and in the entire um, Black Sea. Um, and therefore, what is our challenge? Our challenge is to persuade the Russians that there is no such thing as a short war against NATO, that they could not possibly wage it without incurring far greater uncertainties, far greater risks, far greater costs than they anticipated that they're willing to contemplate and that they will inevitably end up in this long war which they are very much afraid of. Um, I think this challenge for us is eminently realistic. We have, we have started to address it, but we're at a very early stage of uh, addressing it. And my last point about weaknesses. Oh, finally, I've discovered the microphone. I thought, hope you were hearing me anyway. <laughs> My very last point, and then I will end. Uh, it was brought out, actually, by um, now the chairman, I think he's now the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the United States, uh, General Mark Milley, when he was chief of staff of the U.S. Army, said something very interesting, I believe, in 2017, 2016 or 2017, in his annual his annual um, absorb review of uh, the security situation. He said, even for the United States, it is extremely difficult to anticipate and identify the capacities and technologies that will uh, matter and will define military success in 20 years, t in 20 years time. What I think one can say with confidence is that in 20 years' time, the United States will still be in that competition. I think China will be in that competition. There might be some other actors that will be in that competition. Unless Russia radically changes uh, its approach to the economy, uh, takes serious measures to arrest the year-on-year technological decline in relative terms of its industrial base and defense industrial base, Russia will not be in that competition in 20 years' time. And that is also comforting news for the West because it means without turning ourselves upside down, without turning the tables, without becoming extremely provocative, simply by incremental measures and what I prefer to call strategic persistence rather than strategic patience, um, the threats we face from Russia will become less relevant and its relative power will decline. One footnote to that and then I will stop. The Russians are very good and very open, both in warning us about what they, what they find unacceptable and what they're going to do about it. This was the case before the Georgia War, it was the case before Ukraine. But they're also very good in advertising what they're afraid of. If you read the, if you follow the military press and their writings and you listen to uh, official statements and so on and so forth, they are very nervous about a new category of weapons which are sometimes summed up as prompt global strike. That is to say, um, high precision, conventional weapon, weaponry, highly accurate, um, some on ballistic missiles, some at global ranges, which in the words of the chief of staff, uh, General Gerasimov, have the potential to achieve 
strategic results at the outcome at the beginning of a war in a matter of hours, including strategic results against national command and control structures. When you talk about weapons that can take down control structures for a Russian, you're saying, game over. Um, they are very, very worried about this. They have no counter to it because their technology is not there. Their one counter to it, and they're very insistent upon it, of course, is a nuclear response. If their response in a war in the Baltic states to a strike of weapons of this kind that basically takes down Kaliningrad, if they are willing in response to consider the death of, of, of 30 million people, um, and you want to consider that a, a, a credible deterrent, well, we'll go ahead. I think this is a position they do not want to find themselves in. But it is the position they worry about. Anyhow, I will, I, I will leave it there. Uh, I'll leave those complexities hanging in the air. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you for, for the nice cliffhanger. It makes my life a lot easier because I already have two more questions to ask, provided that you would have none. Uh, but before we move to the Q&A session, we, too, we have two more panelists to contribute to the reality check provided in the framework of the present project. So I would like to ask Anna Maria Kish from the Central European University. Anna Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I immediately will set an alarm, um, hoping that I will uh, finish on time. Uh, thank you very much for the political capital uh, having me here today. Um, it's, um, it's a true pleasure, pleasure to be um, here. Um, actually, Russians say that sitting between uh, uh, two people with the same name, so two Andras is on my uh, right and left, uh, uh, brings you luck. But having James Sherry on my right, I should be extremely lucky. Uh, uh, I am here today and in the future, hopefully as well. Uh, so that's a little Russian superstition uh, of the day. Um, so um, I have also the pleasure, so to speak, uh, to have, uh, but it's not a pleasure, of course. Um, I have little to do with this report as such. So I brought topics uh, that I was asked to, mainly concerning internal uh, situation in Russia. And since the time is limited, I brought uh, um, three uh, main top, three main topics uh, practically. Um, uh, I will talk about today about terrorism. Islamic fundamentalism in Russia uh, and the situation uh, today, uh, crime, violence and uh, public safety, of course, because how to speak about internal security uh, um, uh, without it. And another one I picked from the um, uh, security in social terms is income insecurity, which I think it's good to talk about. But of course, there are many other issues that I will leave out today. Um, 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 we can all read up on or, or can... Um, uh, follow it uh, afterwards. So in my remaining um, 13 and a half minutes, um, I will address first uh, the terrorism issue in Russia and I need to go back to uh, to the infamous Caucasus Emirate. If you have heard about it, the self-proclaimed uh, terrorist network that was established uh, um, with, uh, of course, a long history, but was established in 2007 um, and lived, so to speak, till 2015. But I will elaborate on that. So the Caucasus Emirate after 2007 was uh, very successful in renewing violence in Russia. We can mention many terrorist attacks you might heard of in 2010, the double metro bombing on, on the red line in Moscow, uh, Domodedovo airport bombing, Yevsky Express, etc., etc. So uh, with many casualties and of course the fear in Russia uh, uh, was growing. Um, however, um, uh, mid-2015, uh, part of this Caucasus Emirate uh, um, pledged uh, allegiance to ISIS. Uh, but here comes concern number one. Uh, there is a minority who didn't uh, accept this step by Caucasus Emirate. Uh, so today we end up in the, ended up in the situation of, uh, of several individual, uh, pretty autonomous radical cells all over Russia. Uh, which pop up here and there, also in Siberia, in St. Petersburg, don't need to go um, um, too far. So um, that's a significant um, national security threat for Russia, uh, one. Um, the second concern, um, just fresh data from 2018, from December, um, uh, it seems that uh, around 4,000 Russians uh, left to fight for ISIS, the so-called foreign fighters, um, what is even more interesting, um, uh, contrary, I think, to the, that might be a myth, 
only 600 died. So uh, without adopting the concern and uh, uh, the threat that the um, coming that those coming home pose to Russian security, um, it's also a fact that only 11 percent of those who remained alive came back to Russia since then. So the question comes, of course, where are they? Uh, of course, they are in Turkey. And here comes another issue that concerns Europe as well. They are also in a diaspora in Europe. So uh, it's a long-term threat for Russia to uh, uh, cope with this um, uh, returning foreign fighters. Um, and um, what is um, uh, more visible in the press and, uh, and, and in Russian politics today is uh, the returning of women and children who, was, who, was, who were born, born or uh, taken uh, uh, um, uh, with their family members uh, to join ISIS. So um, a cutting of policy recently was that first they took uh, with charter um, um, flights uh, women and children as well. Um, the recent policy is no women, only children. So that that poses another question of uh, how to do and what, what to do with them and um, uh, other many issues. Uh, concern number three um, is the rejuvenation of fighters. So these are practically kids today. So it, the, the thing is about the, 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 the age range we're talking about is 13, 14 even. There were cases in, in Chechnya of, of, of 13 years old kids. Um, concern number four is that it's not only poor people who were joining ISIS and who are exposed to radicalization. Um, concern, what concerns Russia, of course, I can talk about Russia more. Uh, these are educated people. And that leads to the uh, counter violence, uh, violent, um, <clears throat> counter violence strategy, uh, countering violent uh, extremism strategies of the Russian Federation, uh, uh, which is uh, another question whether it can be at all successful. And of course, it's true for Russia. What is true for for the uh, rest of the world, uh, and this this common wisdom probably that. Um, ISIS is gone, okay, but the idea remains. And what we'll do with these people if something else uh, emerges. Um, concern number five related to this is uh, freedom of speech, of course, um, uh, because James uh, uh, also uh, mentioned already the control over um, internet uh, of the Russian Federation. Just last year, the uh, Duma again um, passed the law on uh, in, uh, internet defamation. Uh, so, uh, just as in 2017, a lot of internet censorship, and of course it has to do with um, countering uh, extremism in the internet, but of course it, it has a lot to do with freedom of speech and, um, and other areas. So the second uh, issue I would uh, like to tackle very briefly today is uh, the crime and violence and somewhat of a public safety. Um, although uh, first disclaimer would be that I'm not a criminologist, it's a whole other, another field, so uh, I would purely talk about, about um, um, what I find interesting uh, uh, for further research as well. Um, the second disclaimer is, uh, I think, an interesting uh, fact that um, uh, some of you might know that uh, Interpol no longer publishes um, crime statistics on their website because of misuse uh, of their data. And it's very hard actually to get um, good, fresh and uh, comparative analysis on, on crime statistics, for instance, worldwide or Europe-wide. So it's, you need to really compare each and one country. So what a researcher can mostly, uh, and I am, so a researcher can mostly rely on national data. Um, uh, which is another question, um, but national data can be found in Russia uh, concerning crime. Uh, obviously, the prosecutor's general, general's office, uh, and it has data on homicide, drug-related crime, robbery, uh, um, uh, prison population, illegal armed trafficking, etc., etc. Uh, the 2018 data shows actually that the overall situation in Russia got better, but of course, uh, in most of the in most of the indicators and segments, uh, of course, it's a data compared to 2017. But if we compare the data um, um, to the 90s, which where the, where the situation was quite bad in Russia. Uh, it's much better, it drastically dropped, for instance, the homicide, it's around 5.56 uh, uh, homicide per 100,000 uh, people, so that's how they, they count um, 
um, uh, these issues. And also prison population is historic low, uh, although in Europe Russia was still leading um, a decade ago. Um, um, the statistics say that 42% um, of all crimes in Russia are theft and embezzlement. Uh, that also uh, raises many questions. Um, I want to drive your attention to 2017 uh, statistics, uh, which uh, uh, relates to all my previous um, topic about terrorism and that I haven't mentioned, but if, of course it's um, uh, for more informed uh, about North Caucasus. Uh, which is very interesting because uh, uh, I think it's also misperce mis misperception concerning North Caucasus how big it is. But because population-wise, it's 50, around 15 million, so it's a bit more than one tenth of the uh, of the population of Russia. However, it's less than one percent of the territory, uh, and very mountainous territory. That's another thing. Uh, so, um, in 2017, uh, crime statistics by the Prosecutor's General's Office, uh, North Caucasus is among the most dangerous places in Russia, uh, among uh, severe and most severe crimes. I don't know whether my translation is good in Russian, it's Tyashki and the Sova Tyashki Pristuplenia, has uh, doubled since 2016, as well as the North Caucasian republics uh, are leading the list of crimes committed uh, by, by those perpetrators who uh, do not have a uh, stable income. So um, North Caucasus Republic, uh, republics are known of notoriously uh, high unemployment rates. Uh, and of course another topic uh, which I cherry picked here, but it's, uh, that's the topic where you can find a lot of uh, good reading about is the state organized crime nexus and the mutually reinforcing uh, ensemble of these two uh, I just to, to pick one name that is famous is Mark Galeotti, who just published recently a book called The Vore. Um, but uh, there are other readings on the topic as well. Um, and in my remaining four minutes, uh, I would tackle the issue of income inequality. Of course, I could have picked a lot of uh, other issues, but since uh, it was, I think, only about uh, uh, population in the report, I, I thought I would, I would bring something uh, more, more concrete in social terms. So, and the numbers are very telling in Russian case because um, um, Russian ratio, for instance, income ratio, so the richest 10% and the, the poorest 10% is 17. It used to be 15, but the gap is growing. Uh, and these are not only numbers that I, of course, just uh, picked from whatever, but uh, Olga Galadets, for instance, she uh, now um, she's still a wise uh, uh, prime minister, uh, but now she's uh, uh, responsible for sport and culture. She used to be uh, responsible for a uh, social um, uh, field. So um, what she said is that the very unique thing, uh, besides this being a very sad fact, is that these people are working people. So these are not unemployed people. So the wages, as well as then uh, we can talk about the pension reform um, uh, was a was a, a, a big thing uh, in Russia because of the very low pensions and the very low salaries, obviously. So uh, this is something unique um, concerning Russia. Um, in the latest World Inequality Report from 2018, uh, where also uh, Thomas Piketty was editing, I think it's five of them, uh, concludes a very very um, sad thing we should think about is that. Uh, I would just quote that, that would be fair. Inequality levels in Tsarist Russia were very high, were very uh, uh, high and comparable with possible even greater levels seen post-Soviet Russia. So practically the report uh, uh, puts the Russian inequality revel levels to 1905, over. That's something to think about where Russia uh, ended up uh, in these last uh, 100 years. Um, of course, uh, concerning income inequality and generally regional inequality and inequality between uh, regions in Russia, um, probably the most prominent Russian research is Natalia Zubarevich on, on this. Uh, she writes a, a lot about uh, regional disparities. Um, and uh, she says that the thing is that um, the average inequality was... Uh, reduced in Russia, however, it always comes to but, right? <laughs> but it was achieved uh, due to oil revenues and uh, 
inequality uh, begun to, to uh, reduce only because of state paid workers' wages were uh, rising during Putin era, especially. Um, so um, I think I will stop here and uh, give Andras my one minute that remains. Uh, and if you have any further questions, I would be ha happy to answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all the enlightening good news uh, and also for, uh, for being so punctual on time. So uh, I would give the floor to Andras Dirk. Happy to announce that you have one minute more. Oh, May I have those very nice slides that uh, some of my students have invitation uh, sometimes but so I was asked to deliver a reality check and also <laughs> some sort of assessment of the, in this debate mystification or demystification so in my first half of my um, contribution I'm going to provide statistical data uh, in terms of reality check uh, and the second half I will give an argument in favor of uh, why it is justified to see Russia a little bit bigger than globally it is. Uh, area. And two arguments in favor of why we should definitely demystify Russia in the regard. Oh. <laughs> okay. That is not easy. So. Uh, sometimes reality is more complicated than perception, um, definitely. I had three slides, basically, about <laughs> economy and energy. The first, I would like to start with, uh, with energy because well, the perception was rather correct. And usually, in terms, of, in terms of the Hungarian population's perception about the Russian economy, in my understanding, is surprisingly realistic. So they know where Russia is. I know this is not... Uh, we don't agree fully uh, in this with uh, uh, the report itself, but I will show why I think so. So, uh, let's start with gas. So the raw data, definitely, uh, if you look at EU consumption as a whole uh, and Russian Russian uh, exports in EU gas consumption is 30, 35 percent. And uh, the bulk of the Hungarian, the, the respondents, as you see, uh, hit the bull. This is surprising a bit because we live in a country where 100 percent of the imports come are Russian molecules, even if they don't come from Russia directly uh, in terms of trade, <coughs> but in terms of physical delivery, they come. Well, there is a bit of statistical game, so you can put uh, imports even higher if you include Norway into the EU. Well, this is justified in very many statistical providers include Norwegian gas production into the EU production because this is the same custom zone. And you perceive as not as a market, as a share of imports. And then we go above 50% in the top, but it's, it's okay. What is more tricky is the GDP. As you may know, there are six countries, China, US, uh, Germany, United Kingdom, Russia, and Hungary. And the respondents had to uh, make a, a ranking. And you see the results here. Well, and the report said from the, from the IMF uh, global, um, global outlook that on current prices, the result is fifths in this ranking for Russia. So definitely, Russian GDP is the fifth in this list. Well, the problem, uh, so it's not the problem, but current prices include exchange rate volatility. And exchange rate may change overnight. So after 2014, on a current price-based GDP calculation, Russia has lost one-third of its GDP overnight. Yeah. 
And uh, well, <clears throat> so this is very good when we speak about short term um, crisis, whether they can repay for in debt, <coughs> how it how it's influences export import relations. But for example, I don't use current prices in long term series looking at GDP. I, I use constant prices. Other yeah. prices include exchange rate to some extent, depending on what year you choose. And if you choose, if you would like to compare countries, different countries, regarding their capabilities, how many rockets they can produce, how many tanks they can produce, what is the welfare, economists usually use purchase power parity GDP. And if you go to the IMF play, uh, page, you will find a dozen of different GDP data. And uh, the most favorable GDP data for Russia is definitely this GDP purchase power parity comparison. And if you compare, compare Russia on this basis, Russia, uh, the first is China, the second is the US, the third is Germany for 2017, and Russia is only slightly after the Germans. And Russia used to be before the Germans, before 2013, in many years. In 2008, in 2011, 2012, Germany was in crisis. So, well, thing that well, depends, depends. I think that third, fourth, fifths are correct, depending on how you measure GDP. It's, 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 it's to some extent realistic. When you come to, and this is my last, was my last slide. Oh, yes, export partners, yes. Um, well, I will argue that almost all of these answers are correct. <laughs> except, except this 19, below 19. Um, so what was said in the, in the um, report used Central Statistical Office numbers from Hungarian <coughs> Central Statistical Office. Okay, I usually use Russian custom statistics or European custom statistics, not from the statistical providers, but that's a, that's a, that's a bit different. Well, definitely in 2017, uh, Russia represented, or constituted 1.7% of Hungarian exports. It's not a big share. And on a country ranking, it was the 17th. So and that was report, uh, reportedly, that's, that's, that's the uh, one, two, three, four, five, six category there, between 60s and 80s. But the big question is whether the EU countries can be separated or not, because they belong to the same customs zone. And even publicly, we very much referred to Russia as the biggest non-EU export market in the hung of Hungary in the past. But in some markets, you can take EU as, as a single entity. Well, most of, the, most of the goods and commodities belong to this. In some special segments, you cannot. For example, in pharmaceuticals, there are some national regulations still. Anyway, if you take the EU as a one country in this list, Russia is on the sixth position, so in the second column. And if you take a step back and you think that perception is a little bit delayed compared to reality, and go back to 2013, prior to the crisis, to the Russian crisis, and you take not exports, but foreign trade, but I don't think that we can fully ignore energy imports as a matter of influence on leverage. So in 2014, for foreign trade, uh, Russia had a 5.7% share of Hungarian foreign trade, and it was in the third position. Uh, if we take countries separated, and on the second, if we take uh, the EU as a single entity. So it's tricky, it's tricky. Uh, this is the uh, this, this, this latest data is the most favorable for Russia, 
Um, the one was in, included in the report. That, these three variables, this is present, the most favorable is, is, is past. But still, so if, if we speak about public perception, um, you cannot give a wrong answer, basically. Uh, well, so uh, my, now my argument comes why it is justified to see Russia bigger than it, it globally is. And this is a very simple argument, because we are in Eastern Europe, and Russia is rather close. So who is our second uh, foreign trade partner? It is Romania. Where is Romania globally, in the global economy? Nowhere. And still, for Hungary, because of its proximity, it is quite an important country. So you cannot fully ignore the fact that things that are closer looks bigger. And they are in, really, they are bigger. Uh, so it is not Brazil, it is not South Africa, it is not even China. And uh, in order to give a bit of more elaboration to my argument, I checked the largest Hungarian companies, what role Russia plays for them. It is easy to understand that for SMEs, they don't have regional strategies because they maximum go to, to, to one neighboring market. They, they don't have the, 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 the magnitude. For multinational companies, strategic corporate decision making is not made in Hungary. So Audi does not discuss strategic corporate issues with the Hungarian government. They are not in Dürer, they are in these decisions made in Düsseldorf and they go to Berlin to discuss these issues. So where in Hungarian external trade, external foreign policy, economic representation is overwhelmingly made by large Hungarian companies. The three largest Hungarian companies are MOL, it's an energy company, I don't provide any data, it's enough to say that it's in the energy business, uh, I think. And the two others are OTP and Richter. Richter get on 2017 data uh, revenues. 25% of their revenue came from Russia. 35% of their revenue came from CIS. This has been going down for a decade. So they started from 50%. Still today, it is higher than the EU's share. EU's share is 34% in the Richter says. So it's Still, the CIS have one third of the revenues of the, uh, of the Richter. So, and this is not, not trade. So they invested into the Russian market, in Ukraine, they have uh, manufacturing there. So it's something more complicated. And the other one is OTP, it's banking. In terms of assets, uh, of course, Hungary is the biggest one, but in assets ranking, the Russian filial is the fourth after Bulgaria and after Croatia. Croatia is not fully comparable, but um, because it's another design. In terms of profitability, Russia is the second. And if you ask Shandor Chanyi about the top three mistakes of its 30 years long uh, uh, leadership in the OTB Bank, between these three, three things that will be the uh, I, I went to Russia too late, definitely. Um, so for, for, for Hungarian business, for some segments of the Hungarian business, for those who are capable to have regional strategies, who, and the regional strategy is the entry point when you start to influence foreign policy somehow from the business side, uh, Russia is still relatively big. So this is my argument in favor of why why, why to take Russia, it's a little bit bigger. It is not a Hungarian phenomenon. For example, IBM regional sales, well, if you look together the CIS and the, and the new EU member countries, half of, the, half of their sales good come from Russia. And, and all, the, all the rest combined is, is the other half. So Russia is a very high populated country with a relatively high GDP. And so in terms of aggregate demand, it's, it's, it's a quite a big quantity in the, in the region, when we are speaking about the region. 
uh, my argument, two arguments uh, against. Uh, first argument that since 2014 it's quite obvious that Russia is in decline. And uh, uh, so uh, they still, still grow better, a little bit, slightly better than the EU itself in terms of global, compared to global growth rates, but they are two percentage points beyond the global growth. Uh, and uh, while well, Russia is full of surprises, of course, but there is little indication that some sort of Russian miracle will happen again. The chance was there before 2013 and especially before 2008 when we, when we, when we saw um, seven percentage points GDP growth for a decade. But this is over. So, um, well, the, the potential is not that big. And the second argument in favor, that I don't think that you, by political means you can achieve too much macroeconomic benefits. Of course, some companies can achieve benefits. Some, some gas can be a little bit cheaper. Uh, but I haven't seen too much evidence, except some post-Soviet countries like Belarus, Armenia, uh, and even to a lesser a lesser extent, these countries get the benefits from Russia. That in the macroeconomic sense, foreign policy uh, goodwill is convertible to major economic and financial goods. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andras, for, uh, for the insightful comments. And as an academic, I very much enjoy being again proven the, the eternal truth of academic research that no methodology is ever completed. So there is always uh, a, way, a way to go forward intellectually. I find it highly inspiring. Uh, and before giving you the floor, first I would like to ask the panelists whether they would like to react on, uh, on each other's comments briefly. I mean, you have James something in mind, perhaps? Yes, I think if I have to choose from my shortlist to one, um, I have a, just a question to Anna Maria. I'm very pleased, I was a bit relieved also, that after speaking about the terrorism issue, you spoke about the issue of criminality. If I were to play the devil's advocate, my hypothesis would be that if you look at what we consider to be crimes in the West, the situation in Russia, is far from terrible. But the real crimes in Russia are not crimes that we think about in the West. They are normally property related. They stem from the fact that if you are powerful and well-connected enough, and you want somebody else's assets, you can effectively just take them. And the courts and the law enforcement will back you up, and you can threaten and uh, you threaten people's livelihoods, their daughters, blow their cars up, all the rest of it. How much of this gets into crime statistics is questionable. But I wish, you know, it's it, it, it perhaps only possible to have a subjective estimate about this level of criminality in rational life. But, I mean, do you agree with me that this is important? Indeed, I do. And, uh, well... I came with a uh, not still not that positive, but more positive uh, data, of course, but which is official. But indeed, um, uh, that's not the whole story. And you are um, uh, right in saying that many things do not get into uh, statistics, and uh, this uh, concerns what I just briefly mentioned: the state organized crime nexus. What you also mean here, so. Um, and of course, the, the uh, well-known term in, in Russian is Krishavanya, which means, if I, literally trans uh, if I literally translate it as roofing, but what it means is that uh, state officials and official bodies providing, or just as, uh, in certain individuals providing safety to criminals in many, many, many uh, cases. And of course, this won't, will never end in, in statistics. 
and up in statistics. Um, so um, indeed, uh, it's different talk to talk about this topic um, 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 as a scientist, as a researcher with providing no data, and that's why I really advise you to, to read uh, books uh, because it's highly popular to, to talk about this nexus between the state and organized crime, especially what concerns you know, it's uh, the division between a big fish and middle fish and small fish. So uh, the, the Russian state, I think, very well understood whom uh, he should work with, uh, which he should work with. Um, so, um, indeed, I do agree. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Anna Maria and Rush, any reactions to, to each other's comments, presentations? No. Good. Then comes yes. the part you've all been waiting for, uh, questions and answers. But before giving you the floor, uh, I would like to remind you kindly about the importance of the meaning of certain terms, meaning that a question and a comment, these are different things. Uh, so now this is the time for questions. So please be brief and nice. And before uh, asking your questions, please say your name and identify your affiliation. So ladies and gentlemen, the floor is yours. There I see one. Great. My name is Shandor Kerekesh, and I'm a correspondent. Sorry, the mic is coming. Kerekesh. Makes no difference, but don't worry about it. Uh, I write in the Canadian Hungarian Journal occasionally. My question to you is simple. How creditable is it, and how much fear should it generate, this newly uh, reported newly newly threatened type of uh, rocket and nuclear weaponry. Should we take this seriously, or is it just a grandstanding on the part of Putin? Thank you, sir. Uh, I suggest we collect the first group of questions, and thereafter our panelists can answer individually. There, I see the second one already. Please enter. Thank you. I'm Bolaj a student from uh, Collins University of Budapest. And uh, my question would be, and it is addressed to the whole panel, that uh, after uh, Putin built out his system and uh, switched uh, positions with Medvedev, is it really true that it is quite impossible for him to leave the system or keep the system uh, from now on? Thank you. To leave? You mean, that you mean that he will not leave at the end of his constitutional term, that he has to find a way of staying beyond that? Is it? <laughs> or were you being less specific? So, uh, I just want to that, understand your question. That, uh, it is basically impossible for him to, to uh, cure the system. He has, basically has to be uh, a part of it until the end of his life. Ah, okay. Thank you. I think, okay. Thank you. A third question, perhaps? That's always a good topic, and we always have questions. That's very lovely. Hello, my name is Bence Faragu, I'm a student of ELTA, and uh, I have a rather serious question. Uh, so despite what... <laughs> and despite what Mr. Putin claims, and despite the ads that every Russian sees, the very infamous Krim Nash, I think we can all agree on that having to annex the Crimean Peninsula was the greatest loss in the last 10 years of the Russia, of Russia uh, diplomacy. I mean, having to annex it because it uh, it means that Russia actually claimed that it lost uh, Ukraine from its sphere of influence. Uh, what I would like to inquire is whether there are now current uh, trends to try to influence the Ukrainian population to um, to get back Ukraine into the fold, so to say, or rather, Russia treats it as a lost territory with no chance of regaining. Thank you. Thank you very much. These three questions, uh, I think, provide a good, a good starting point for, for all three panelists. Which of you would like to start? <coughs> James has volunteered to be the last one. So the choice is for you too. Uh, so I, I don't think that I can answer um, these questions. I can give some, some, some of my thoughts. Putin is without Putin. Um, so, well, um, what 
as far as I understand the, the basic problem of the, of, of the current regime that it could not find a, a broader social base for itself uh, inside Russia. So, well, you have to decide which class interests you serve. And in this regard, uh, well, Putin and his entourage tried to uh, make such kind of coalitions in the past, but they they don't trust none of these uh, groups. So they don't trust, uh, let me say, the the emerging um, uh, bourgeoisie, if, if there is any. They don't trust the the good old oligarchs. They don't trust the middle class. They don't trust fully even the conservative nationalist uh, classes. So in electoral terms, of course, you can identify who is going to vote for the regime, and this is, this is something, but, but you need something more. So still, uh, the situation is very similar to that with, with when they arrived. When they arrived, uh, this was a small number of military technocrats, military bureaucrats, who had a vision about a sovereign, uh, a modern Russia, uh, and they wanted to, to make this dream uh, uh, happen. And, um, and uh, now I see two, three hundred uh, military technocrats, much more richer, of course, but still isolated in many, many regards. And they have the power, but, but they, don't, they, they, they don't have this kind of understanding. Uh, so it's very similar what happened in the major reforms in Japan. Kamalata, Kamalata Turk made a major coalition with, with conservative classes in in, uh, uh, in in Turkey in in, in, in the twenties, but uh, so this kind of thing. Um, so what, uh, the the critical question is, I think, uh, the, whether Putin can leave or not, is and how he can leave or not, is uh, whether he can find a, a, a broader support within the alley, not only the. But if it's if it's about uh, this three hundred people, and the rotation. In, the, in this group, it is manageable, uh, but uh, I don't think I don't I don't know whether it is sufficient to 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 keep Putinism running uh, in this way. And well, getting back to Ukraine, just very sure I, I will leave it to James. But uh, well, in in economic terms, uh, so there is no gravity to the EU within the Ukraine. Uh, it is very difficult to. To, to measure at this point because Ukraine suffered a major economic shocks, shocks among others. So it lost not only Crimea, but also lost uh, uh, the Eastern Ukrainian territories. Um, but uh, what for me, in Moldova we see a bit of, a bit of gravitation towards the EU, even if in, in a very, very fair way in Ukraine, not really. Um, I think the question that concerns me is uh, Putin without Putinism, uh, and I think you might have um, um, also uh, had in the back of your mind um, um, the article that was published in Yezavisima Gazeta earlier this February um, by Vladislav Surkov. Uh, about exactly about this question, uh, who set up a course, well, quite again, so to speak, about um, Putinism as an ideology, um, comparing that uh, to Peter the Great, Lenin, Ivan the Terrible, etc., etc., so the great, great people of Russian history. Uh, and um, he, in ex uh, not explicitly though, but a lot of articles uh, that I read was about uh, saying that, well, this, uh, not explicitly, but means Putin without Putin, Putinology, so, uh, or Putinism, so to speak. Um, so that is a figure you can change if, if as Andras also mentioned, uh, the circumstances allow. So if you, uh, um, well, I won't, won't put it in, a, in, a, in an article, but uh, uh, this, uh, if it's, it would be Chatham House, I would say that my personal opinion is 
uh, why a scenario uh, as happened with Putin cannot happen this time. So that was a mostly unknown person to many. Medvedev wasn't that known before. So I mean, uh, it's not necessary. It's not necessary a person who who uh, who Russians know or we are looking for or that Sovietologists or Putinologists are are uh, uh, trying to to uh, imagine uh, ruling Russia. So um, that's also a scenario that is, I think, highly possible. Um, I don't have good answers, as as Andras would say. If I would have, uh, I would be how you do you say, uh, very rich or very dead, right? Yes, so uh, uh, same, uh, <laughs> uh, same here. So uh, concerning Ukraine, uh, I wouldn't leave this very, I will leave this tough question to James and, and uh, Andras, but my, my short answer is no. The easiest question for me to answer, believe it or not, is yours, sir. Uh, I think these, um, I think, I think in strategic terms, uh, this exotic weaponry has uh, very little significance at all. It doesn't change the realities uh, that are faced by either side. And because time is limited, I will, I, I will take the liberty of not elaborating um, on that answer. Except to say, this is not about, uh, my answer does not imply they're not going, they are not capable of doing what they're advertised, of, uh, what, uh, performing as advertised, or they are, it's quite separate to that. It does not change the strategic equation, they're not relevant. The, um, the second two fascinating questions. Um, I think that Putin, Putin is captive of the system that he has brought to fruition. He is not a dictator. His problems or would be far simpler if he were. He is, this is essentially a neo-feudal system which is evolved in a way that it is by now run for the benefit of its key stakeholders who in a conservative estimate number several hundred people who combine enormous amounts of wealth and enormous amounts of power at various levels throughout the Russian Federation. More than <coughs> several hundred, but that kind of number. And in this matrix, Putin is effectively like a strong feudal monarch. This is a system that is based on overlapping patron-client relationships and baronial type of networks that work together and fight wars with one another and so on and so forth. So for me, Putinism can outlast Putin. And that is the real issue, and this system has been engineered in such a way that its effective reform of rejuvenation are now impossible, and yet it's co-opted so many people into <coughs> these structures that I think any catastrophic or revolutionary outcome is also ruled out. Um, so I think what we're more likely to be looking at is something like the progression of a degenerative illness um, in Russia. And it matters, because I come back to the point I made in my lecture, whatever the Russian authorities do, the technological level of industry continues to fall. Because this whole structure, this whole mechanism, is not conducive to innovation. It's not conducive to an open economy, to competitiveness. Come back again to discussion I was having with Anna Maria, because it's not irrelevant. When Arkady Dvorkovich was simply advisor to Medvedev. I was sitting at a luncheon table with him. He's now deputy prime minister. He said there is no such thing as legal private enterprise in Russia. Consider the implications of that. Consider the implications of the fact that he said it. Um, the Krim question. I, it's a very logical question, but I think it's wrong. I think the premise is wrong. Uh, Russia hasn't lost Ukraine. Russia hasn't conceded that it lost Ukraine. Russia to this day, and I'm not saying, I'm not agreeing with them, I don't, I think they're mistaken. To this day, but they believe the time is on their side. To this day, they believe that Ukraine is fundamentally uh, an artificial make-believe construction that is held together by the West, um, that it will unravel and collapse, that there will be further disintegration, and the West will become fed up and go away. And they have absolute confidence. We are here. We will be here forever. We are not going away. 
so they will not relax, in my view, um, until Ukraine is uh, subordinated and transformed into a satellite or, or, or broken completely. And the, um, what I think a, a highly reformist, different type of political leadership and group in Russia will agree to at most are a set of agreements with the West that neutralize Ukraine. But I think even this will be seen as a kind of intermediate stage. And I was only yesterday, without naming names or telling secrets, with I think most of those people who understand Ukraine very well in the British system, we were all in remarkable agreement about the fact that Russia's underlying perceptions and its objectives have not changed at all since 2014. Thank you. Uh, time for a second round of questions. There I see the lady and thereafter the gentleman in the corner. Please identify yourself. Um, hello, I'm Sofia uh, from Moscow Journalist. Uh, thank you for your report, but also I have uh, one little uh, demystification before I ask a question, if you allow, uh, about uh, freedom of speech, lack of freedom of speech. I'm a journalist, I work in Russia, so uh, I don't see this lack of freedom of speech. If you compare it to France, uh, we can write almost about everything we want. You can even, I can even criticize Putin in some aspects and nobody kills me. Um, I'm alive, as you see. <laughs> okay, sorry. And my question is uh, about double standards of image of Russia. Uh, from one side, I see in media, Russians did it. Russians uh, spoiled Skripal. Russians interferes uh, something. Uh, Russians influence, uh, influence some elections in all uh, the world. From other side, Russia is weak. Russia uh, cannot allow to make some um, technical steps, etc. Uh, some numbers were correct. I thank you for this uh, big report. But uh, don't you think it's kind of double standards to, in some case, you, to imagine to make an image of Russia like very weak country, and uh, from other side, um, powerful, uh, evil, something that has influenced everyone. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, next question, gentleman in the corner. Thank you very much. Pavel Antonov of uh, Blue Link, uh, Civil Society Research and Communication Network for Bulgaria and Central and Eastern Europe. You have uh, mentioned, uh, Mr. Sher, that um, Russia is uh, aiming for a short-term short term war. That's the strategy. Um, uh, and the strategy you, you described was breaking the unity of the West uh, through this short-term uh, war. But arguably, the unity of the West is already broken. If we look at some indications, at the uh, narratives of the US president around uh, leaving the NATO, or if we look at the situation in Hungary and other countries in the EU, where issues like human rights, issues like women and gender rights are actually denied by the ruling governments um, in contrast and in conflict with the shared values and perceptions of the European Union and Western democracy. So would you agree or would you not think that by putting Russia in the center of this discussion, by giving Mr. Putin credit for achieving this, we are actually giving him, making him a favor. Isn't it back here in the EU and within our democracies that we should be looking for the answers? Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. And let's have a third question. Uh, there I see the lady right behind you. Hello, my name is uh, Ekaterina Popova. I'm PhD here, and thank you for your report. Speaking about novelty of this topic, I totally disagree that it's novel but it's only my opinion so um speaking about russian aggression and friend or uh, threat we meet the direct and indirect answer from the perception for, for, from receiver but why don't we speak about soft power answer from those countries who perceiving this image why uh this answer also aggressive to russian actions if you understand what I'm talking about. No, not yet. Not, not exactly. If you could elaborate a bit more. Uh, probably I just don't hear it correctly. Okay, so um, imagine that we are perceiving the image of the country, like of Russia. And um, 
we are receivers and we see Russia as a threat, as an aggressive country and living in Europe or anywhere outside of Russia. Why those countries who are receiving it not answering with a soft answer, I mean soft power, why are we just um, answering the same with aggression? Where is the diplomacy from those countries? All right, got you. Uh, that's the second round of questions. Who would like to start? Uh, if none of them, then as a co-author of the report, uh, I would try to, to react to the question of our journalist colleague about double standards. Uh, it's a very legitimate point to, to point out that sometimes pictures are not black and white. Sometimes we just have the 50 or the more shades of gray. And in this particular case, when we measured the opinion of the Hungarian society, yes, certain duplicity or certain like double-sidedness is indeed visible. One part, the Hungarian society tends to overestimate Russia's powers and capabilities. And on the other side, uh, so, I mean, this is the, 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 the one side of the standards, but on the other side, op opinions are quite negative. So, yes, the question is indeed legitimate also regarding the very opinion of the Hungarian society. There is no clear-cut perception of Russia. Uh, so, this, this is something we are facing here. Uh, regarding, because your question was a double standard as a whole, factually, I don't know because we don't have data, we don't have such type of data for, uh, for other European countries. This research is just hopefully beginning of something bigger. But here uh, in the Hungarian case, we indeed see that there are pluses, there are minuses, there is a, a double-sidedness of, uh, of the opinion. I'm not sure, however, I mean, employing double, and this is, this is again like, like theory and methodology, uh, applying double standards, it's like a purposeful action. I purposefully decide that I judge you by A and I judge you by completely different criteria B. Uh, this would be applying double standards. However, I'm not sure that this we can apply for the society. I don't should, I'm not sure that the society has a conscious policy of double standards. That's, that's actually part of the problem. That uh, for the political elite, for the political decision makers, uh, it, it really makes sense in some cases to speak about double standards. I fully agree. That's, that, that's what we have in many cases, not necessarily only about Russia. But when it comes to the population, I'm not sure that from their side it's a conscious deed. Um, first, in any discussion about Russia or anything else, whatever country was it one's in, one will not only find double standards, you'll find ignorance and blatant stupidity. Um, when one's having a discussion with people who are experts, who are talking about facts, who are talking about evidence, who are talking about real people and real statements and real policies. I don't think it's terribly constructive to stand up in a generalized way and, um, and, and, and speak about double standards. If there's something concrete that has been said uh, that arouses disagreement, Hradi uh, Boga, that's wonderful. That's why we're here and I would love to hear about it and answer it. But this is not a question, the sort of question which can, be, uh, which can be answered or constructively addressed. The question that came to me, I'm grateful for it because your question suggests I have been misunderstood. I don't believe Russia's political aim is to start any kind of war against NATO. That was not my point. My point is that we live in a world which I think with good reason Russians see in antagonistic terms in Europe. We have two normative jurisdictions in Europe. We have, um, we have, we have different value systems and political models. We have different power complexes. We have already had kinetic conflicts, force on force conflicts against independent states in, with respect to Georgia and with respect to Ukraine. I have sat in a room and heard people whose names I won't mention in Russia, very high ranking, say that um, the Baltic states need to look at what events in Ukraine and draw conclusions for themselves. Um, um, in 
this environment, it is the responsibility and duty of military establishments to consider the possibility of war. My only point is that if war is likely or in prospect, the Russian aim and the Russian strategy in place now is designed to bring that war to a victorious conclusion at the shortest period of time and bring the West to the table on Russia's terms. One reason the Russian today are so active inside the political systems of the West and uh, so influential in the West is actually to strengthen the divisions you refer to. I know they didn't create them. Russia has never succeeded in doing anything by creating vulnerabilities. We've created all of this for ourselves. Um, and I fully agree with you, our principal priority must be to put our own house in order. Uh, but given all the divisions that exist, you can understand the basis of concern that if a war were to come about, if NATO had to face an Article 5 situation, that decision makers in Moscow might conclude that a short war would be the very thing that would destroy NATO completely and bring us, and bring us to the table and create a completely different Europe. So that's, you know, that's what I'm talking about. It's not about what somebody wishes to happen. And it's not about where responsibility to lie, lies. Uh, I think as a, you know, as a matter of principle, security begins at home. It's first of all our responsibility, whatever sort of adversaries we face. So I hope that clarifies things a bit. Thank you. Uh, just um, uh, a brief response. Uh, I'm very grateful for James mentioning that uh, I think, and we should uh, we should mention uh, more frequently that Russia didn't create these divisions but exploit them. So uh, I think the the quite of a hype going and a bit of a uh, um, um, a lot about uh, of Russia being uh, behind uh, our, uh, our back all the time uh, creates this misperception of of uh, Russia creating the problems as well. Uh, just recently pu uh, uh, published article by Tom De Valle in uh, Politico also. Uh, entitled Eastern Europe's problem isn't Russia uh, going uh, deep into the politics of Georgia, Moldova there, and, and I think a, a bit of Central Eastern Europe as well, of, of um, underlying uh, this perception, misperception of, of Russia creating problems um, versus um, exploiting them. So I think that's uh, important, uh, and that also relates to the question of uh, weak uh, versus powerful evil Russia. Um, that was in the question. Um, I just want to add that uh, what comes to my mind when I hear that is uh, Fyodor Lukyanov, who is a very prominent figure in, in Russian uh, politics, academia. He is somewhat in between. Uh, um, uh, he said that, oh, thank you that you kind of uh, see us that strong. I mean, that, that, that powerful and ultimately powerful in the world, that's something... something uh, um, uh, they would uh, uh, want to see, but of course, I mean, it's half joke, half half truth. So, of course, uh, they are not um, as weak either. Just as to say, not as strong as we perceive <coughs> them. So, um, I think I will stop here. And... Well, as a moderator, I have the unpleasant duty of reminding us that we have a question unanswered, like what we, uh, or or PhD student colleague asked about why other countries are not applying similar or other soft power tools against the perceived Russian soft power pressure? I'm not sure I agree that's the case. Before 2014, soft, uh, soft power was seen to be the West's overwhelming strength. I wrote a book actually contesting some of this mythology. Um, and I think what has happened in recent years is that we in this part of Europe have rediscovered far too late that hard power and military power do matter. Um, and when they're used, they can be decisive factors. So that's where, how I see the situation. And I personally think that soft power has a very limited role to play 
if another country is in the middle of invading uh, your own. Uh, all right, well, you disagree. That's why we're here. Uh, but that is, you know, that is my position about it, that if, if you cannot, um, that you need to be able to answer certain threats, you, to defend yourself and answer them in the terms in which they are posed. Um, the, I just also have to say, and forgive me if I sound agitated, when you invite experts on Russia to speak about Russia, they speak about Russia. That does not mean they believe that Russia is the most important country in the world or the most dangerous. But if you are asking them to explain what is Russia's role in doing X, Y, and Z, that is what you're asking us to do. So please don't fault us for it. The, the second thing is the issue fundamentally is not. I mean, it's a red herring even though I've said it myself that we have created vulnerabilities for ourselves. If you're talking about an external actor, the question is, what is that external actor's stance? Is he trying to make this better or worse? Well, I am suggesting, I don't think I'm the only one here, that all of this division and fragmentation suits Russia's interests, and they are trying to exacerbate it in any way they can within the ground bounds of safety. And um, why shouldn't we take issue with that? Um, is someone suggesting that because a bank is very poorly managed and uh, the staff leave and they leave the doors open, the lights open and the safe open, that, that the, the, uh, the, the burglar who comes along and just easily takes what is there is somehow justified uh, and, and shouldn't be arrested or censured? I mean, these are two different things. Sorry. I... <laughs> Okay. Uh, yes, we have a third uh, enough time still for another round of question. There I already see the gentleman at the door, and we have time for two more. Well, thank you. <clears throat> uh, my name is Gabo Horvat, and I'm with the Daily Nape Savo, and this is an excellent event. Uh, still, I'm somewhat intrigued um, because um, I wouldn't, but this is a British Hungarian event. And I wouldn't be able to name a pair of another pair of countries which contributed more to the weakening of Europe lately than these two countries. Uh, would you please uh, assess? Uh, just a strange coincidence. Uh, would you please assess the the significance of joint action uh, to counter the the real or the perceived threats uh, of Russia? Thank you. One question about the joint action. An excellent commentary. Uh, we have time for two more questions. Anybody? Any more questions? There I see one question in the back to the gentleman in the blue shirt. Finally Thank you very much. Good, Tomasz Molnar, uh, Research Fellow of the Institute for Foreign Affairs and Trade. Um, as we are among our British friends, I will start my question from the British perspective. Um, there was a series of reports um, conducted by the House of Commons uh, with uh, the MFA and other ministries. Uh, considering the review of balance, balance of competence between the UK and the EU. Uh, there was a report um, yeah, in 2015, and I think report number six was on foreign policy. And among other things, the report was arguing that any sort of um, yeah, uh, striving for a, for a strategic partnership between the EU and Russia, from the British perspective, as long as it was the, the report was arguing, is ill-conceived. And here comes my question, uh, which is like two-folded. One, if you would agree uh, with the statement of this report. And uh, the second, if you are not, how should the relation between the EU and uh, Russia look like? Thank you. Thank you for the question. And the last brave one still asking a question, still having something unanswered. You're all longing for the coffee. Good. So the word goes back then to, to our panelists. Perspective. Well, I would, um, if I can, reciprocate the spirit in which your question was raised. Um, I wish it were the case that, like the United Kingdom, Russia would cause immense harm and concern by actually withdrawing from something <laughs> rather than entering it. So let me leave that there. Um, the... Uh, 
strictly speaking, I, you know, I should not be discussing this. I haven't read the report concerned. But all I could say at a personal level is, first of all, I'm very sorry that I am soon not going to be in a position of discussing this from, you know, from the position of one of the top, uh, one of the leading members of the European Union. There has been, with regard to Russia, no, there has been a unified EU policy, not about everything, but about the main things. It was the French permanent representative to the United Nations who said after the annexation of Crimea, Russia has declared war on the Charter of the United Nations. It is not a British policy that I think I have been discussing. Um, there has been an extraordinary unity of Western policy. Angela Merkel not only supported sanctions, she led, she organized. She was the, the coordinator and the mobilized driver behind this. As a result, Germany's trade with Russia in 2015 declined by 20%. And they were willing to accept these costs. It was Angela Merkel who said at the G20, we will continue, we will oppose uh, these violations of international law, the attempt to recreate politics of spheres of influence and domination, irrespective of how much inconvenience it causes to us and how long it takes. So I don't think, you know, there are just nuances of difference between some British policymakers and some European policymakers on these questions. I'm as agnostic as possibly you are as to how long this unity will last and over what. Um, I also am disturbed by the fact that many people in the UK who support Brexit uh, do not support the main premises of our policy towards Russia. If you look at Nigel Farage, the head of the UK Independence Party, which might have received funding from Russia, and I'm not saying it did or it didn't, he said, I don't know what's wrong with Putin. I think he's a great leader. Well, you know, fine. So I would resist this temptation to, you know, construct a dichotomy between British and European views. Thank you. Then he was almost qu quoting uh, Bush, the youngest of, uh, looking into Putin. Trump, or Bush looking. Bush, Bush, Bush. Uh, looking in the eye of Putin, right? And, and uh, finding him a nice guy. Um, um, concerning EU-Russia relations um, in the future and, and long term, uh, good to speak after James because um, um, he mentioned a lot uh, and um, uh, that I was, uh, I was uh, planning to say that, but also, um, on political level, it all, uh, in the end of the day, goes back to trust, right? So, and the trust is historically low on both sides. Um, and a one million dollar question would be, of course, to, to how to rebuild trust. And I don't have good answers, but um, if uh, what conflict resolution suggests, but that's a... Um, uh, would be to go back to low-key issues such as, but of course, I mean, since it's about trust and the, the political atmosphere today um, uh, in the West and in the EU uh, in particular, um, such issues as visa liberalization that our Russians are, are uh, looking forward or what they uh, were looking forward uh, or, uh, you know, talks about how um, European Union and Euro-Asian Union can, if but they want to see it working with EU concerning trade. These are the big uh, questions, but uh, whether um, in the near future we can end up talking about these issues, I don't think so. I just can tell you from the um, academic perspective that I know that many, many of, of my colleagues in Russia and in the West are working on finding some ways or at least keeping the contact with, with Russian colleagues and, and trying to to look into to possible issues. Thank you. Uh, just a short comment. So uh, I think the, what is different, but well, I don't know what strategic, whatever with, between EU and, and uh, Russia means at the moment. In the past, 
Of course, strategic cooperation aimed some sort of convergence, uh, growing economic activity, social cohesion in one way or another. Uh, this is not on the agenda right now. So what the EU would like to have from Russia, in my understanding, is peace and, 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 and some sort of, don't, don't, don't make any, any, anything stupid uh, on, the, on the East. And I don't expect any kind of major change in this regard. So I've, what, what can be expected is not a strategic cooperation between the EU and, and Russia. Maybe some sort of detente if, if, if they can make some sort of agreements on basic security and political issues, especially as far as the Soviet space regarded. On the economic front, Russia has been turning to the East very fast, and this is very much progress. In 10, in 10 years or so, uh, parity between the APEC and the EU in terms of trade will be achieved. So Russia is not an EU satellite anymore in terms of economic activity. E energy, the same story. Uh, its significance in the total, the EU significance in the total uh, Russian energy ex exports has been decreasing from a very high level, but still decreasing. Money is coming from the, from 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 other uh, other consumers. So. <laughs> I'm not saying that the EU will disappear for, uh, in Moscow's uh, relational setup, but it has been losing leverage, definitely. And this is a long-term strategy, uh, long-term trend started much, much before the Ukraine crisis. Thank you. All right. So, basically, I think... Uh, we all deserve, and particularly you all deserve, a big thank you for, for staying with us. But before you, I let you go to enjoy the coffee waiting for you outside, uh, first and foremost, there is a number of another thank yous to be said. Uh, first and foremost, of course, we, we are particularly grateful for the British Embassy for supporting this project, actually for making this project possible. Uh, and we very much hope that there will be a way to continue this cooperation and also to improve the methodology and thereafter provide other countries with the recipe to, to conduct similar researches. Besides, of course, we are all very much grateful for our three guests who accepted the invitation, Anna Maria Kish from the Central European University, James Scher from the Chatham House and the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute, as well as Andras Deak from the Institute of World Economics of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. And finally, of course, you yourself also deserve a big thank you for staying with us for so long. And now the session is closed. Thank you all.